I hope I can share a story with you today that will make people realize what the family really is all about. Uh, I was blessed with goodly parents, good mom, good dad, but uh, maybe tie a little bit both of those in today, but it's just the family. Uh, Grandma and I were blessed with great parents, we really were, but it was so different. And I'd like to maybe draw a little comparison here today of those two parents. Uh, Grandma comes from a family that is her brother that went on a mission, is the third generation brother to go on a mission in that family. Her grandpa did, her grandpa Joseph Edward went on a mission, Wickley Gubler went on a mission, and Lynn Gubler went on a mission. So that's three generations. I was the first, I was the second missionary on my mother's side to go. My grandpa went and then I was to go. So we skipped that generation where, where Annette's family did three generations. I have two, but on the Johnson side of my family, I was the first full-time missionary to ever serve a mission in the church until you go way back into the early history of the church. And I'm not sure we find any of those there. But uh, I'd like to just tell the story that I've, I've drawn a conclusion of. Your grandma Annette and I had great dads, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those right now. My father was not active in the church until that my mom and dad were married in the temple, but dad never really went to church until I was about 14 years old. He ordained me a, a teacher in the Aaronic priesthood. And up until then, my grandpa Habern, he blessed me, he confirmed me a member of the church. Then it was very interesting, you just went to the church house and they just baptized you. Whoever was baptizing, baptized you. And, uh, and then my grandpa Habern confirmed me. I just come out of the baptismal font and sat right there by the, on the edge of it. Never even had a chair, just sat on the edge of it and grandpa confirmed me a member of the church. My parents weren't even there. And uh, I just went to church one day and they were baptizing, so I was baptized. Grandma's was a little different than this. But uh, I wasn't raised actively in the church, but I was always raised with prayer in the church. I never remember my father ever not praying. I always. When we went camping, uh, you know, at, and at home I didn't see him kneel down by the bed a lot, but we had family prayer a lot of times. Always had blessing on the food. So I was raised in a very religious family, and so, as Grandma Johnson was, Grandma Annette was. But those two men were, were powerful men, really powerful men. I want to talk about Annette's dad a little bit, a great scriptorian. I loved to, I loved to discuss the gospel with him. It was wonderful. He, he knew the scriptures, and I wonder if his, our son Bevan doesn't come up with that a little bit. I think Grandpa Wickley kind of primes him a little bit and says, all right, you, and uh, Bevan, Bevan's getting to be a, quite a scriptorian in his own way. And, uh, but my dad never knew the scriptures really well. But there were two really neat, neat people. Grandpa, very strong in the gospel. Grandpa Wickley, Grandpa Austin, very strong in the gospel, but in two different ways. One with the knowledge of the gospel and the other one just a strong testimony of the gospel and a strong testimony of the family. I remember him telling me that his father came to him when he was 15 years old, right after his father had been killed. His father, my great-granddad Abner, whom I'm named after, was killed accidentally with a gun accident in a car uh, where he was removing a, a 30 30 with the old lever action on it, pulled it from the car, and it accidentally shot him and killed him. And uh, he, I remember my dad telling me one time he came to him and told him to go take the shoes off from a horse. And uh, I, that stayed very strong with me. 
and uh, I remember hunting with him a lot. Never do I ever remember one time that we ever went to bed that we, and I slept either in the same bedroll with him or next to him. And uh, son, have you said your prayers? Let's say our prayers and then go to bed, go to sleep. And uh, you know, my mother, here's a good story. And my mother tells the story of my father. He, he, he drank socially, he wasn't an alcoholic, but he'd take a drink once in a while and once in a while get a little intoxicated. <laughs> And uh, he come home one night intoxicated, drunk, and uh, my mother, oh, it was awful around the house when this happened. My, my mother did not tolerate drinking at all. And uh, Dad come in and got ready to go to bed, and he knelt down to the side of the bed and said his prayers. And my mother says, just how far do you think that got out of this room? You know, I've thought of that so many times, you know. And that just sounds like my mother. That's just that she's just like a little banny hen, you know. And uh, I, I think that was a, a great example. And I would like to pass that on to my family. I don't care what you do, how bad you feel like you are, never feel like you can't pray. I think that's a great example of what we need to do. There, Grandpa Ock was drunk disobeying the commandments of our Father in heaven, but he's kneeling there saying his prayers. Family, let that be a, a message from your great-grandpa. That is a message that I think we all can listen to. You know, I was taught to pray by my mother, but I was taught the importance of prayer and when I can pray by my father. What a, what a neat combination. They were a great set of parents. And you know, now I want to go back to Grandpa Wickley. Uh, my dad didn't know the scriptures like Wickley did. You know, Ock just didn't know the scriptures that well. He knew them, but, and, and you know, I've read some talks about it. I was surprised how much he used them. But uh, he loved the gospel. He loved the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he just, he, we just lived it. He just, he didn't have to go to church every Sunday. To, it was just there for him. And uh, Wickley just, what a great man he was. What an example for our children to have. And Matthew, I'm so glad that you're recording these so that these can be passed on to them. I wish they were sitting here telling their own story. Uh, Grandpa Ock was a, gr a good hunter. He, in, in, in those days, he was a very good hunter. He would be a good hunter today, but we hunt a little different today. We'd get on horses and ride through the country and and uh, scare a deer out and kill it, you know. And uh, he taught me how to take care of meat. We took care of meat. The minute it was killed, we, we took care of it. A lot of times we skinned it right there. We always had seamless sacks with us, generally a pack horse. And we'd skin it out, let it cool off a little bit bit and then pack it out and it was clean. I remember how bad he scolded me one day. I was skinning a deer and I got quite a bit of hair on it on the hindquarters from the skinning and boy he, he got right after me and he says you don't do that in the Johnson family. <laughs> he was a good hunter, a lot of fun. I, I, that's why I loved to hunt I think. I, I loved my father very dearly and uh, sometime I'd like to tell Matt the story about some things that have happened. Uh, if, if I denied the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think I could be forgiven. Because I, I wouldn't ever deny it. Don't take me wrong. Don't ever take me wrong there. But I really think I'd be able to come back and, and be forgiven. But if I ever denied that family is eternal, I don't know that I could be forgiven of that. Because since my father's death, I've had three several occasions where we have visited and I've felt his presence. And someday we'll tell those stories. Uh, my father was, my father, both of our fathers were taken very suddenly and very inopportune. Uh, Grandpa Wickley was, was, I think, 65 when he passed away, just barely retired and was taking care of the water and supposed to got up and turn the water and uh, 
Grandma went in there and he's gone. He dies of a heart attack. My father, 65, and my father at age 47 was killed in an airplane accident down by London, Utah, down west of Cedar City. Uh, at 47, uh, I had just returned to, from a mission. Uh, Annette and I, Annette was expecting Bevan that same year. That'd be January 28, 1961 is when Dad was killed. And Bevan was born that year in May, or in April of the 19th. But uh, a very tragic thing, and a tragic thing in the a whole community. Uh, today, I was to a funeral down to uh, Kenosh, to Vicki Watts' funeral, and met another brother to, to uh, Leonard Watts, the, the husband to Vicki, and met her, his brother Clark. And he couldn't tie me in, I don't know, and I said, you maybe remember Ock Johnson, the government trapper, that was going, oh, I'll say I do. I remember the stories and that, you know. So that tied us into that. Dad was very well known, and, and his supervisor was Adria Alstrom in Kenosh. But, uh, but the thing I wanted to say there at that funeral, that tragic thing, but the thing that is so interesting, a, a man by the name of Tarv Broderick, who one day when I was probably... 15, 16 years old, I was helping uh, an uncle, Boyd Nielsen, Nelson, unload some lumber. Then the, the lumber had come into the lumber yards in a train car. And then you'd go down and unload it, and take it over and separate it all out. There'd be one buys, two buys, two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, two by twelves, two by fourteens, all kinds of things. We'd take it off a piece at a time take it back to the lumber yard and put it where it goes. Well, one morning I went to the lumber yard and, man, there's a man laying back here on this lumber. It's cool. It's in the summer. And it's cool back in there. And he's laying there asleep. And I thought he's dead. I thought he had died. Boy, I went running in, got Uncle Boyd, and I said, Boyd, come here quick. There's somebody out here. I think he's dead. Man, Boyd came out there and saw him and went over and shook him. And he says, Tarv, come on. It's time to go home. Well, he got drunk. He was a town wino, and he had been drunk, and he had just, and the lumber yard was on his way down, and he had a hole in the fence. Well, he'd got in there and got in there and, and gone, to, gone to sleep, passed out. <laughs> so anyway, Tarv Broderick was to my father's funeral, your great-grandpa's funeral, and the stake president was there. I think that describes my dad. The town drunk and the state president. And now I want to compare that to Wickley. Wickley was somewhat the same man, but he hadn't been on that side of the fence like my father had been there. He had been solid on that side. And I think now is the time I need to share with my family and pass on to them what my father passed on to me. One day we were riding over on the Mantai Mountain. This, this was in September, and Dad was killed that je next January. So not long before he was killed and taken out of this, away from us. But we were riding along there, and, and, and oh, I didn't tell you this. I told you he did drink once in a while. Well, my father chewed Copenhagen. <laughs> and uh, if you've ever had an experience with Copenhagen, it's quite interesting. Uh, he, he shared it with me one time, and I, I knew I wasn't man enough to do it. It made me so sick. Well, anyway, we were riding along there. And now remember, Dad was in the bishopric now. Uh, while I, when I went on my mission in 1956, uh, Dad would have probably, well, Dad got active in the church in 1952 because he got active. Uh, a cousin of mine, Steve Vance, uh, I lost a, my older brother, Doral, was my older brother. He was my dad's sister's son, second son. There was Steve and Doral and Cheryl and Larry. There was three boys and the one girl. But Doral was just older than I am, and he, he had come up and spent all summer with us, and he stayed with us in our house. 
we just had a lot of fun. He was my, my mentor. He was the one that raised me and taught me some good things and some bad things. Well, anyway, we were, were, <laughs> were uh, at home there in Cedar. We'd moved to Cedar City for a while. Dad was a government trapper, and he was down there. And we uh, heard that Steve and Shirley were coming, this cousin. And Doral had just been killed about a year before that in, a, in, in Korea. In, in the in the military, he was killed over in, in Korea, and uh, Steve and Shirley were there. And I remember Shirley or Steve said, "I'm here on on an order of your sister. My mother and my dad are going to the temple to be sealed. They weren't active, and they were going to go be sealed. And my mother wants you to sit in, stand in for Doral." in proxy in the temple. And I remember my dad looking down and thinking, and then everything was quiet. And I remember the whole family. I remember my mother looking at him, tears in her eyes. He looked down, and then he looked up, and he says, I'll do it. Now remember, he had a word of wisdom problem. It's the only thing he probably had to keep him out of the temple. I don't know that we were paying a full tithe then either, but I know we paid tithe at times. I'm not saying it was full, but I, I don't remember when there wasn't tithing paid in my home. And as far as I'm concerned, it was a full tithe for me. And, and my family, for my dad's family. But I remember him looking up at Steve and saying, I'll do it. But I also remember one day we were in Cedar City after that, and it was a Saturday, and we stopped in town, and he went in and bought a can of Copenhagen. And I remember him coming home one day. I need to go back a little bit. Right after this, he, he said, I, I've got to quit. And... Uh, it was probably within, the, probably all of this was within a month after Steve was there. And I remember he came out one day and he said, boy, I'm sick. He says, I'm just really sick. And he, I, mom says, well, have you been chewing? And he says, I had one chew this week, that's all. She said, well, if you hadn't had that, you'd been better. I mean, mom was not very tolerant with his chewing and his drinking. Well, anyway, he, he says, well, I'll try. Well, anyway, I remember I was out milking one day, and he come back to the house and drove into the truck, and I was doing the chores, and he come over to me, and he, he threw up. And he says, son, he says, I am really sick. And I said, what's the matter? And he says, it's, it's my tobacco. He says, I had a chew today, and he says, it's made me sick. But he says, I can't get along without it. He says, I need your prayers, you know. And, and I remember, you know, we sat there and talked for a few minutes. And I remember the last time I saw him ever, when we went into Cedar that day and he bought that can, he was, he was just jittery, he was ornery. He just, it was awful. I mean, it was, he was grouchy. You couldn't hardly talk to him. And uh, he bought that Copenhagen and put a chew in his mouth. And he was a clean chewer. He really was. He didn't spit. And... Uh, I don't know what I was doing to his insides. But anyway, we uh, went a little ways, and pretty quick he stopped and took that chew out and threw it away and took that can of Copenhagen and threw it away. As far as I know, that was the last chew he ever took. But anyway, going back to this, now that story then, that would have been in 1952 or 53, fifth, probably 52 also then. No, that would have been in 53. I think, anyway, whenever Doral was killed, he, whether he was killed in 51 or 52, we need to look at that. It doesn't matter that that much. It had been 51 and 52 when I was in Cedar, so he'd been killed in 51, 52. So it'd be 52 when this happened. And then the time that I was with him over on the Mantai Mountain was in 1960, 60, September of 1960 is when it would be. And we were riding along, and he reached over in his pocket, and he kept that news in his right his left pocket and he'd reach in and get it with his hand and then got that and I laughed I says hey dad I thought you'd quit chewing 
And I remember he just turned clear around in the saddle like that. And I remember his leg was out there and he turned around like that and he says, Oh, hell, son. If there'd have been a chew there, I'd have taken it. And we laughed and giggled about it. I said, I thought you'd quit. He says, I have. And we rode along there for a little ways and I remember oh, it was a beautiful setting. There was pine trees. I remember looking up there. I could see him going up there and he turned clear around again like that in that saddle, and he said, Son, please do not waste your life like I have wasted mine in the gospel. I'll never forget that, Matthew. Never. Never, ever, ever. And I pass that on to you and all of my posterity. Don't waste your life in the gospel like Grandpa felt like he had wasted his. Great man. Your Grandpa Ock touched a lot of lives. And I'll tell the other story when I'm ready to tell it, but it ties into what ministering, what this new gospel that we're just bringing into the, into the whole church, this is what ministering. Your great Grandpa Ock ministered to a man by the name of Speed Riding that brought speed into the gospel, but how long he worked with speed to get him there. And now what's happened? That man, that speed riding's grandson, was the one that ministered to your uncle Ray when Ray was wounded in Vietnam. And uh, how things happen in life. Your grandpa Ock taught me that life isn't by chance, that there is a God and there is a Jesus Christ. And he loved the temple. Your grandpa Ock loved to go to the temple. Uh, if my mother had just said, Ock, don't, I don't care if you go to church, just go to the temple. I think my dad would have been in the temple years and years before he, he was married there. He had that, he knew what it was, but he just, didn't have the strength to stay in it. And there's, what, 14 years, over 14 years, that, fifth, probably over 15 years there. I think I was born about two years after they were married. And uh, I'm the oldest, and I think it was uh, probably 15 years there that he turned around in that saddle and said, Son, don't waste your life in the gospel like I've wasted mine. But boy, he made up for it. Yeah, he made up for it. Great man, great people. You have some wonderful, Matthew, you have some wonderful posterity there behind you. And you know what, Matt? I've decided this life isn't very long. I'm 82 years old now. My dad only lived to 47. Grandpa, your, your two great grandpas, 47 and 65. I've outlived both of them a lot of years, Matt, and my life isn't very long. I remember so well when I was a little guy, and I remember so well when I met your grandma. And I remember really well when you were born. We were hunting antelope with Uncle Calvin over on the Parker Mountain the day you were born. Yeah, that's the day you were born. We were over there, and uh, I remember we got word that you were, that you were, now a member of our family. We hurried home. Grandma couldn't wait to get home. We got her home and, and we headed right straight up and saw you and I remember giving you a blessing. Your mom was there. It's, but Matt, you know, we're, we're blessed. Uh, we've come from some great, great families and uh, uh, I, I, I'm anxious to, I hope we don't get there too quick, but I'm kind of anxious to see what it's going to be like over on the other side. To, to see what our, see just exactly what our, your great grandpas have built for us to go to over there. Mm -hmm.